go, John 12, Mary anoints Jesus at Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. This is interesting because, oh yeah, he did, leave, he did leave at the end of chapter 11. So he heard that everybody was trying to kill him. Oh yeah, yeah, so he went to Ephraim and he stayed there with his disciples. So I don't know how much, well, let's see. I feel like earlier we saw that it was a couple of days before, I don't know. It probably says how long before the Passover it was. Because I think it mentioned them going down to purify themselves before the Passover. And now it's six days before the Passover. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't matter. But just trying to get the placing for where we're at in the scripture. Because cause like something massive just happened was with Lazarus, right? Like he raised him from the dead. So what's going on now like how is it is life back to normal or what i don't know so okay so they gave a dinner for him there martha served and lazarus was one of those reclining at the table he's just chilling because he's like dude i was dead and now i'm back mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of jesus and wiped his feet with her hair okay so so this was the account that was mentioned in the last chapter. And uh, I couldn't quite remember at the time, like which situation was it? Because I know that in another gospel, there's a situation where Jesus, there's a woman and, and there's Pharisees there and they're judging her for doing what she's doing. And, and I don't know if it's the same account in a different gospel told in a different way, but Forgive me. Uh, maybe that's a maybe that's a study. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's continue. Maybe maybe we'll see. So she takes this pound of expensive ointment, and she anointed his feet and wiped it with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas, one of the disciples who was about to betray him, said. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Uh-oh. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help him he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, "Leave her alone so that she may keep it keep it for the day of my burial." For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So I guess what I'm struggling with here is, is this the same account as the woman who broke the alabaster jar? Because this says that it was Mary, who's a good friend of his, and she took a pound of of ointment and she anointed his feet and wiped it with her hair. Now I'm remembering, remembering another story where somebody was crying and the teardrops were on his feet and she was wiping those with her hair. And then another story where the alabaster jar was broken completely and all of the perfume was, was poured out. And then that was the one where Jesus says, as often as the gospels preached, this story will be told. So, yeah, I'm getting caught up in like which which story is which. Are they different stories? Are they the same story told in different ways from different perspectives or not? And it probably doesn't matter for right now. But again, I think for me, that's going to be a, a go back and study because I, I like to sort those type of things out. But for today, this is a devotional reading and so the the primary purpose and goal of this is that we will connect with god and grow in a relationship with god uh, devotionally relationally not just academically so for now i'm gonna i'm gonna sit on this as a uh like wow however you slice it uh, sit on this as a wow however you slice it it's 
it's a sacrifice and a gift and an offering to Jesus. So, let's continue. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death. I just I never thought about this before, but like, were they not thinking like, if we kill Lazarus, Jesus will just raise him from the dead? Maybe they're thinking, we're gonna kill Lazarus just because we're mad at him because Jesus rose him from the dead and we're gonna kill Jesus also and then he won't be able to raise him from the dead. I don't know, this is so silly. These guys just, uh, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Yeah. He's like, hey guys, <laughs> you know, my testimony's like, hey, you know, like, I was once far from God and super prideful and like really mean to people in high school and then Jesus saved me. Lazarus is like, I was dead. <laughs> like, actually dead. No, like, literally, I was dead for four days and now I'm back to life. So, that's a pretty good testimony and People believe in Jesus because of that, and so they weren't happy. <laughs> oh man, they're like, let's just kill him again and then stop the guy that's gonna raise him. Oh man, that's funny. All right. The next day, a large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and they went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, which I believe means save us save us blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord even the king of Israel so what we're gonna see is a crowd in Jerusalem cheering for Jesus celebrating Jesus and welcoming Jesus in as a Messiah um, and I believe that the palm branch thing wouldn't be completely unique to Jesus. It would have been something that they would have done when other um, saviors, as it were, would come into town. Now, oftentimes these sa these saviors would be militaristic, right? A military leader that's sort of delivering people from oppression or something like that. And this this mighty leader, when they came into town, they would put branches down to honor their coming. So um, this this isn't per se a declaration that we, we all know that you are God um, or that you are the Messiah that we all know that he is in the fullness, that, that he's God stepped in the flesh and he was the, the chosen one, the anointed one, not just to deliver them in a militaristic or political way, but to deliver all of humanity from the power of sin and death unto ultimate life and eternal life. It's not to say that they specifically knew that or believed that, but they but they definitely were welcoming him in a very honorable way, recognizing that he was uh, a Messiah and evidently bigger than that, the King of Israel. So, uh, I just, I, there's just, you gotta be like familiar with kind of the, the full context here because there's like stages and levels with which people came to the full understanding of who Jesus was and what it was that he came to do and accomplished. So Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and had been done to him. Again, we talked about this term when Jesus was glorified, his resurrection, his ascension. The crowd had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. This makes sense that this crowd had been many of them or all of them, the people that saw that he raised Jesus from the dead. Now they're welcoming him in 
and that would make total sense. So when we see here in a few days um, a similar crowd that's yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, it's a question of like, is that a totally different group of people? And where are all these people? Or is it the same group of people that have been persuaded? I don't know. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Remember earlier in the text, we saw a few times it said specifically, my time has not yet come, or the hour has not yet come. And so he would avoid Jerusalem and things like that. Um, it's because this is the hour, right? In a little bit, we're going to see the, uh, you know, the hours at hand. Is there any way that this cup can pass before me? Like, this is the moment. This is the moment that his whole life was for. Um, and earlier it wasn't time, and now it's time. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. never noticed this before but like this is he says all this in answer to this question of can we see Jesus so these dudes ask to see him and then he doesn't really answer the question he maybe this is his answer to the question I don't know he just goes on this monologue about the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified and then a grain falling dying whoever loses his life will keep it whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life there's that term we see over and over and over again in this text if anyone serves me he must follow me and where I am there will my servant be also and if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So maybe this was Jesus' answer to their question. Like, hey, we want to see him. And then he, he says, like, this is my time to take care of this business. But follow me. And this is some ways that it'll look if you follow me. So it's like, following me is no longer just in the physical. Not just walking with me, but following me with your heart. Because this is much bigger than just physical. So I don't, I don't know if I fully understand all of this and how it plays out and, and why this is the answer to that specific question, but I do know the truths, the truths that are found here uh, that we ought to apply to our life, right? That we're not going to keep the life that this world has to offer us. We're going to lose that life and we're going to live a life unto Him. We're going to serve Him. We're going to honor Him. We're going to follow Him and God's going to honor us. Now, my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Here's the hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is so beautiful. I love this statement. He's like, my soul, I, I am troubled. I'm, I'm... And we see in other places that it's like he was so nervous, so um, in angst about it that he was sweating blood. And yet he's like, hey, should I, should I ask to be saved from this hour? No, no, no. Father, glorify your name. This is all about accomplishing your purpose. 
Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd stood there and heard it and said, uh, and said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of the the ruler of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. That's an interesting thing to say. I assume talking about the evil one. I love this. I love this. Listen. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is like this I think this has two meanings number one when Jesus was lifted up put on the cross he will draw all people to himself it was in that act on the cross where he's drawing everybody remember he said in John chapter 3 that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up on a stake so that anyone who looks to him might have eternal life and now he says when I am lifted up from the from the earth I will draw all men to myself but I think number two it also means that when we preach when we when we speak of him when we lift him up above all things on this in this life and on on this earth that we could talk about it's in the lifting up of his name that he's drawn drawing people to himself. Beautiful thing. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. Sometimes some of that gets a little confusing. Where he's talking about the light and the darkness and all that. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so, though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Wow. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So we're, we're obviously dealing with a mixed crowd here because it, it clearly said that many believed in him and now many didn't believe in him. And so the signs aren't a guarantee that somebody's going to believe. So that the words spoken of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. I think that this is a star. Lord, who has believed what was heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Um, there's a lot that could be said about that, the specific prophecy, and this hardening, the deafening of the ears, and the blinding of the eyes. Um, I, I don't want to get into all that right now, but praise God that we have eyes to see and ears to hear, and let us continue to pray that God would open our eyes and open our ears. Isaiah said these things because they saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Wow. They were concerned about being put out of the synagogue. You know, this, this is a huge star. We talked about earlier, their fear was that they would lose their land. These people's individual fear is that they would be shamed among their friends and family, put out of the synagogue, lose their way of life. And so we have to ask ourselves, like, is there anything that I'm willing to, is there anything that would keep me, that I wouldn't sacrifice for the sake of Jesus? A position in life, family, friendships, whatever it is, money, a job, position, power, land. Like, these guys were being stopped from following their Savior, their Messiah, because they wanted to protect their own self-interest and things that they valued more than Him. And it, there's just nothing that's worth uh, exchanging for following Him. Don't let anything stop you, no matter what it is. Last section, And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in Him who sent me. And whoever sees Him who sent me, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. This is why he came, to save the world. The one who rejects me does not receive my words, has a judge. 
the word that I've spoken will judge him on the last day. That's interesting. It's not Jesus. It's the words that he has spoken that will stand in judgment against us in the last day if we don't receive him. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that this commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Oh man, so many good things. Is there anything that would keep you from following Jesus? Uh, are you trusting and begging for signs and trying to convince yourself that you're going to believe when you see him? Because you just don't always believe. Jesus is an example. When you have to go through something and it's God's will, go through it. Oh man, so much in here. So much in here. So my hope and prayer for you is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. I'm getting so many messages from people that man, God is just speaking directly to them, not even through my words and my thoughts, but directly through the scripture. And uh, so that's my prayer for you. And so keep pressing in. I'm proud of you. Keep going. And I'll plan on seeing you again tomorrow. God bless.